We need actually each and every one of you to uh, be part of this because there aren't that many. Um, okay, what I'm going to do is uh, entertain you in the next 30 minutes with a few things here about service chaining, SDN and FV, and how it all comes together. How many folks in the audience are actually familiar with, uh, is this too loud for you? No, it's good. Uh, are familiar with service chaining? Very few. Um, OpenStack, Open Daylight. Okay, so um, we have limited time. I'm going to rush through that. Really what I'm going to do, I'm going to cover many, many areas. So you guys should have many question marks on your face. And uh, if you want to follow up and go a little bit uh, more in detail, we should be doing that uh, later on. These slides are going to be available later so you could get them. We'll talk about why do you need service chaining. Um, service chaining in a broader context of what applications do when they interact with the infrastructure. How does that work in the orchestration virtualization layers? Um, what is service chaining specific technology anyhow? And um, then wrap it all up, bring it all together with uh, what can you get in open source today? So. If we take a look into what service chaining is, pay attention to this stuff right here. This is not working. Uh, pretty much what you want to have, you want to take some section of your network traffic and make it subject to a set of services that you want to control exactly how the traffic flows through that. You would ask, why do I need it? Multiple answers over here. Uh, if you are a telco, uh, provider, each of us have a different contract, each of us have different services. I may be in different parts of the telco uh, network as well. So um, I may need to set up a different set of services. I trust this guy more than I trust that guy or that flow. So here I need to do more on security. Here I need to do more on, um, say, encoding because of the video format you use, the size of your cell phone, etc. So I need to adapt the services I'm providing to you to whatever you're asking me. The same is true also for enterprise and for cloud. This is available in cloud for quite some time. Uh, you could even think about a model where I like this vendor's firewall, bring your own device firewall, put it into my uh, network. As enterprises are moving towards this private cloud environment, uh, their lines of businesses are turning into if you want tenants. So they also need isolation. They need a different HR, for instance, would need a different security setup than engineering. So all of those cases really promote the need for some services on the network that are adjusted to exactly what you want to do. Then you should ask, why should I care? What are the benefits of that? And the benefits are listed at the bottom. The benefits are all about lower capex. We are moving from fixed assets, fixed appliances to virtual appliances that can go and grow and shrink with the demand pretty much quasi real time. OPEX is going down because everything is automated. So I don't need to um, send the person to go and configure tune each of them um, separately. And I could also place them such that they are going to work in an optimal way, and we are going to touch on that later. I'd like them to, to scale. And uh, last, we were dealing with um, the bottom line, the cost of doing business. This also enables new businesses to grow as I modernized my network, as I moved to new APIs in order to enable those services. Now I can look forward to getting some new revenue streams into my organization. But look at the bottom of this slide that we borrowed from Etsy. As you do that, from the application point of view, I'd like to keep somewhat abstract view of my infrastructure. I don't want to have to deal with each and every little detail of uh, what the infrastructure has to do. Um, I need some abstraction. As those entities, those VNFs are really getting implemented, uh, placed, and deployed as virtual machines. So part of the talk, we'll talk about the tension um, between 
what level of abstraction do I want to have, what are going to be the benefits of uh, doing a little bit better than that. And in this schematic um, slide, which I'm not going to go spend too much time on for shortage of time, we are putting the service chaining uh, in a broader context of infrastructure cloudification. It is cloud forces that are driving all of us to change the way we do business. Um, what happens in the process is I have applications and the simple claim I'm going to put to you is I need two arrows in order to do my job right. I need one arrow that goes down from the application into the infrastructure to tell me um, what am I trying to achieve today. What is the policy? What is the SLA? I need another arrow that comes up from the infrastructure for two reasons. Tell me what this infrastructure is capable of, what is available right now, because um, I don't want to go place stuff in the wrong location, and I um, need to know the basic capabilities. And the interesting question, and we have uh, lots of uh, um, work jointly with uh, Cisco, is on how we work together to enable that language that comes in between, which we all refer to as policy. Service chaining is one of those examples. So we'll dive deeper into that. Um, here is an, a reference stack um, that consists of, uh, you could see, telco uh, type of applications on the left, cloud on the right. One interesting thing is that there is a growing agreement in the industry that we will use OpenStack and Open Daylight as the reference for an orchestration layer and a control layer, your network controller, in order to manage um, those uh, resources that we have uh, deployed in the south. Uh, we are providing a reference architecture, it's not a product, that is testing all of this together so you could rest assured that the features are there and you'll see what kind of features we are talking about. Cisco, as an example, has multiple products where they use um, these kind of technologies. One example is listed below. So now let's uh, start diving deeper into those orchestration virtualization layers and understand what is it that we need over there. What are the challenges that we face? If we take telco as an example, telco is a little bit more demanding environment than your usual uh, enterprise user. That is going to come on multiple fronts. On performance, they are used to get the extreme uh, frames per second of a given piece of infrastructure. One of the concerns is, I'm moving to virtualized environment, am I going to see something close to this? This is rather important. It's not just a performance message, because the other thing that happens when I do not have performance, I'm actually using more infrastructure. When I'm using more infrastructure, my cost goes higher. My efficiency goes down. Therefore, I'm less competitive with a big cloud or big mega data center deployment. So performance should not be read as performance only. Scalability and scalability specifically under a service license, under SLA. Um, needless to say that if you are uh, calling home and the call drops in the middle or you have some stuttering, you're not going to be happy. So we need to guarantee at the VM level that you're getting some level of uh, service and obviously when there is a big event like this, we may have more demand in this area. How do I grow that? Um, dynamically and maybe something that may get lost on some people is that in order to do that I really need to drill down to the lowest level. I really need to be able to say when I deploy something on this piece of infrastructure it's going to give me some predictable uh, performance because I'm building everything with Lego I need each of those blocks to have very deterministic performance. You at this point should raise your hand and say I'm not sure, so I'll give you some examples. If we compare the model between uh, cloud and, uh, and the way NFV um, is going to look at that, in cloud we need to go through multiple layers of software which introduces some bottlenecks. In NFV, what the telco industry is doing with our help for quite some time, and that happens in embedded environment, they normally 
try and bypass uh, those limitations in order to get the best uh, performance. When we look at that from the architecture of the machine point of view, how does the machine really look for an orchestrator? On the top I have a very kind of plain vanilla machine. A, a, a server in a cloud infrastructure is a bunch of compute resources, give me some, some uh, memory, and oh, was there an I.O. device too? Um, that is not the case in, in um, VNF where we are really specifically concerned about those challenges that I da just pointed out to you. So I would like to, in this case, use, everybody is familiar with what is NUMA as an example? NUMA, everybody? So I need to, for instance, make sure that my code resides in a memory block that is close to the core it is running on. I definitely would like to, if I had two threads and they are collaborating across multiple cores, they need to be uh, placed such that they are going to enjoy proximity. I may want to be in a situation where I can control and predict my I.O., maybe bring the I.O. into the same NUMA zone so my NIC is not going to be sitting on the other core. That could be easily summed up as what I'm really telling the orchestrator is the guts of a modern server architecture. If it doesn't know those, some bad thing is going to happen. You should ask what bad thing, and that's what, uh, what you'll see in, in the next slide. But this is the fundamental difference. The fundamental difference is I need to explain to you what kind of machine I have over there. Imagine I have some acceleration, like encryption, like compression, uh, whatever I may want to do. Um, if I don't know that, I may see some trouble. Let's move to the other arrow that is coming down, the policy arrow. Basically, what you have is you take uh, you, what your workload is trying to achieve, you take what uh, this policy of whoever runs that infrastructure, including regulation, compliance, and whatever you have, you are kind of baking them together and you create some service model. That's the service I'm trying to get placed somewhere in this infrastructure. That needs to be matched with some model that represents my infrastructure. We just went over the details of what a server may look like in that environment. And I need to match them together. And I also need to feed some updates, some statistics as to what is happening here. So I'm going to have uh, the right match. It doesn't make any sense to put a new virtual machine on a server that doesn't have the features or is already busy. So these are the things I'm trying to do. Now let's see what happens in each of the layers of our infrastructure when we are trying to get a, a simple job like that done. And some people in the, in the audience here with Cisco are actually working with us very close in order to get all of this done. I may want to have some infrastructure policy. There are multiple projects in OpenStack right now. Each of them is giving you one piece of the puzzle. None of them is giving you a full correct answer. I may want to have a scheduler that is not only looking at compute, but is aware of what the infrastructure has, what the workload uh, is asking to do, understands networking, understands storage. This is what we call software-defined infrastructure. And it's going to use EPA, the Enhanced Platform Awareness, so it understands the details of the server. Now, remember, we don't want the application to be bothered with all of that. We want the orchestration layers to understand that so it can do the best job orchestrating and free up the application from all of those details. But if we don't strike the right balance, if we actually ask the application to do too little, we are going to waste resources. It's never going to be as efficient, therefore you may fail competing. If we're asking the application to do too much, now we made application development uh, more restrictive. We don't want to do that either. Um, the network layer, for example, needs multiple mechanisms in order to um, support all of that. Uh, we need the feedback, as an example, into Silometer. In open daylight, 
we need to do that the middle layer. We need to have support for the two arrows coming up and down, as well as specific control mechanisms that are going to allow us to deliver the network services. And the same is true for the virtual switch that resides on the server. Actually, if we stick for a second into the telco space, this is true also as we go up. You see the same two arrows, and we need to have the enhanced platform awareness playing a role in those layers too if we want to be efficient with the way uh, we are going to play services. And we have work going on in these areas to extend this. Just to give you an orientation, these layers in the red box here are the, the virtualization and orchestration layer like OpenStack that we were discussing so far. And on top of that, there are other layers that are recommended by the Etsy Mano spec, for example. So why would that make any difference? If I take two completely identical machines, you'll see the answer hinted to you with two, these two gauges at the bottom. I'm claiming that if I configure properly, I'm going to see significant difference from that awareness. And here is one benchmark, and again, your mileage is going to vary. Depends exactly what you're doing. The only difference, and this was done publicly at the Mobile World Congress a couple of months ago, um, the only difference is the way workload has been placed, what the orchestrator really knew. And you could see that when we look at that from uh, Gigabit's point of view, you're looking at to 10x kind of uh, difference over there. So now, um, I want to just mention the last piece, the data plane. We talked about the data plane's predictability. What do I do for the data plane? And I have a few tricks that I could play over here. Uh, with DPDK, which is a software solution, very popular, very powerful in the industry, I have multiple modes as the four different pillars over there suggest. If in the context of service chaining, I have a classifier that um, is looking at the traffic, trying to make a decision where, what kind of services that needs, that may be a trusted application for me. That may be something that I would like to let enjoy all the benefits of the platform. So from the bottom, I could go into Paul mode driver, PMD, no need for interrupt, save the latency. I can go into shared memory, bypass all the stacks, as the previous slides were showing, go into shared memory, and I could have um, that classifier application working with other pieces. If I so choose, avoid memory copy, use uh, huge pages, so I limit the impact of address translation overhead, but if I have some service functions on the left in the green boxes and those are less trusted, I may want to have a strict cloud isolation model and we support that too. So pick whatever you uh, like and obviously your performance is going to vary based on this. But this is not the only thing. This technology, by the way, is integrated into the Open vSwitch, which is one of the industry leading uh, vSwitch technologies out there. Um, we have uh, more work. Again, this work is done jointly between Cisco and, uh, and Intel. Imagine for, for a minute that we have this magic hardware that um, gets the policy, remember the arrow coming down, gets that policy from the top, but also has the capabilities to enforce that policy. If that is quality of service, if that is ACL, whatever you have. And then it is also have the mechanisms to allow it to go direct from the hardware into a virtual machine, a mechanism we call SRIOV. Now I created a new hybrid of a policy controlled SRIOV which is going to fix some of the problems with SRIOV, where today you carve out a piece of your hardware and you lost control over that. You don't know what impact it has to neighboring virtual machines on the same platform. Putting this under control, adding a policy element, means that now I can have it SDN managed. I can actually predict exactly what 
uh, performance I'm going to get out of that. And I can get it integrated with Open vSwitch. It's, a, it's an official effort over there with DPDK and so on. So now let's get into uh, Network um, Service Header, which is uh, a technology uh, that is implementing service chaining, standard-based technology in the IETF. A short introduction for those of you who said they don't know what it does. I'll start from the bottom. Here is network traffic coming in. I'm doing some classification. Out of that classification, I'm making a determination. Should I go with a service pass index X or Y? Some, set, some subset of the traffic would go this way. Some other subset is going to go another way. And I have different service functions that have been connected in order that are going to service this hop by hop. Those service functions don't need to understand the transport. They could be different places. They could be connected with whatever way you want. But they also have the power to make some decisions. Uh, look at service function three. It could go to N or it could go to two. It can fork the tree. It could change the graph. I also have the ability to utilize metadata as a result of the classification. And I could save additional reclassification. I could create new services because I was able to give a hint to the next guy down with some results that I already obtained earlier in the chain. How do we accomplish that? You see on top the frame format. We take the very popular VXLAN. There was one thing that was missing there, which was a pointer to another header. And that's the only thing we added into it, and it's called uh, VXLAN GPE, all standardized in the IETF. And then um, there is the net, uh, network service header. This is another header that we are adding in the packet. It has few key pieces of information. Obviously, the SPY, which is going to direct you to the right chain, as well as potentially some metadata. And if you want to look at the architecture on the right upper side, you'll see that as we enter the domain of service chaining, I first get this SFF. The SFF is the traffic cap for that environment. It's going to look into the packet, say, oh, you need to go to that chain, therefore the next service function is that, and uh, the service function is going to do its magic, send it back to the SFF, and that's how we are navigating. So again, the service function itself doesn't need to know the details of the transport. It's independent. The SFF fixed that. And we also, on the upper right side, have the ability to support those existing service functions that are not necessarily NSH aware. Uh, one thing here is that on the right side, uh, you could see that this could be integrated really with your uh, network overlay or SDN controller or your VXLAN controller, and that's exactly the kind of work we are doing together at uh, Open Daylight. Um, we actually contribute from Intel point of view into that project in Open Daylight in order to automate the way uh, this works on, um, on a server. So that's the time with uh, five minutes left. That's uh, the time to kind of uh, pull it all together. Remember, the title was the state of the stack. So what happens in the stack when I'm trying to get all of these to work? Imagine that I have this model here um, classifying. I have few routes, firewall, less trusted traffic goes through intrusion detection, more trusted traffic goes directly to load balancer, and you know the rest. If I'm trying to put that on OpenStack, I'll find that OpenStack has multiple options for policy. Uh, some of them in the stack, some of them are not in the stack, none of them supports at the moment service chaining. So we are working with the Neutron community to add basic mechanisms for that. Actually, Ed, who sits here in the audience, is one of the key guys who's driving that from a Cisco point of view. In open daylight, your situation is so much better. In open daylight, you have actually a working solution that between Cisco and Intel is being demonstrated here in this event. 
you could go and check it out in uh, in the respective booth and find that uh, it's actually working not that bad by the way only 100 gig if you need more speed let me know um, and uh, the piece that we are working on is uh, really on uh, also on automating that so it's integrated with the vSwitch, with the DPDK services, and also with a piece of hardware that, again, we are demonstrating that could handle the whole policy in combination with SFC. So before you get some homework, um, this is how it works. If you are trying to put it together from a telco application point of view, follow the green arrow. This is an officially an OPNFV POC right now. And you could go directly to Open Daylight, where the functionality would mainly reside, mainly data plane, a little bit of control plane too. And through those two interfaces of OVSDB and OpenFlow, you get to uh, a popular server next to you, uh, and you could manage the vSwitch, and you get those services to really work as a chain. If you want to go through Neutron right now, there is some interaction through HIT, too little time to describe that, but I do not have those service chaining services yet in uh, Neutron. There are other efforts. Um, Cisco, as an example, is leading group-based policy. We are working together to get it into OpenStack. It is not there. So if I go the red route right now, I'm not going to get through OpenStack uh, service chaining functionality. But if you notice on the left side, the closer I get to the server, the more convergence I get on policy. I get everything in the vSwitch. I get pretty much everything I want for these services in open daylight. As we start going north, there is a little bit more divergence in the industry. Your homework. The following pieces. Uh, you could go and watch it in the booth to see that this is not just a PowerPoint. You could actually try it yourself. Uh, you could uh, work, help us work on all of those projects, uh, wherever they are. And uh, in the uh, NFV orchestration, we need everybody here to uh, voice the opinion that we need a little bit more standardization. And uh, some pointers for you, for material, if you want. And uh, that's it. So if you have any questions, and we have a minute, Happy to support it. We do have a minute. Do we have any questions from the audience now? So hopefully, first, I was able to keep you awake, which is not a small feat by itself. Second, uh, there's lots of stuff crammed into those slides, and, and for a reason, because it's very easy to do a very short, nice talk and show one slide. and you get little content. What I wanted to do here is expose you to a little bit more material, hopefully get some questions. Uh, feel free to get back to us, ask us online, offline, whatever additional information you need. Thank you very much.